encourage you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Joel. It's in our Old Testaments. We got Hosea, and then we got Joel, Amos, and Obadiah. And of course, we studied Obadiah first because in chronological order, at least in my mind, we, that was the, that's the earliest one. But Joel comes right on the heels of that, and we'll look into that uh, at the first of this lesson. We, you have your outlines before you, and a lot of this we'll be looking at uh, introductory material before we get to a lot of the questions. But I uh, want to at least establish in our minds this particular book. Obadiah was written to Judea or Judah, but, but they wrote about what nation? Edom. And so it's kind of an interesting thing that uh, God's people need to understand that when Edom was on the, sitting on the sidelines watching the different nations plunder Jerusalem in 845 B.C., they just sit there and let it happen. Edom was of the lineage of Judah. We see that they, that they were always antagonistic toward one another. And so we observe that because of their pride, they thought they were invincible in the rocks of Petra on the south part of the Dead Sea, no one could conquer them. Who will bring me down? Who's the answer? God rules in the kingdom of nations. He brings every nation down in time uh, when there's no more righteousness left to save it. And he uses other nations to take down those nations. And so Edom would be under, under destruction. And so that, that happened in, eight, uh, in 830 B.C. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles, the, the, the 21st chapter is where we see the book of Obadiah coming into place. This is what we established, and, I, and there's a reason for starting there tonight. But we said, Jehovah stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines, the Arabians, and the Ethiopians. There was a plurality of nations that plundered Jerusalem in the book of Obadiah. And so it happened in the, the East, that the Jehovah stirred up against Jehoram. Jehoram is the king of Judah. He has been going wrong. He's been uh, not pleasing God. And God is stirring up the nations to go judge, bring judgment upon the uh, people of Jerusalem. And so they came up against Judah, break into it, and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house and his sons also and his wives so that there was never a son left save who? This becomes important for our prophecies in Joel. Who's left, according to your translation? Mine says Jehoahaz. Uh, he'll be Ahaziah in the next chapter, but it's the same one. He was the only one left when they killed all of the, of the children of that lineage, and so he uh, comes on the scene, and we begin to see some background that we'll see in, in Joel's lesson. So they, they drew lots, uh, the Philistines and the Arabians, according to the book of Obadiah, they chose lots. So it wasn't one nation bringing down Jerusalem at this time. That would happen with, in 722, the Assyrian nation would bring down the northern kingdom of Judah. And then in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar of the Chaldeans would bring down the southern kingdom. Those were just one nation's conquering. These are plurality of, of, of nations around them. And so there's that distinction that the internal evidence from Obadiah tells me we're looking at probably 830 B.C. Uh, when, when that, I, I, now I'm looking at 845 B.C. I'm looking at Joel 830, so a little bit later. So let's look at this particular prophecy. What does the word Joel mean? Joel, appreciate this. What does the word Joel mean? Jehovah is God, not Je Joel is God. Jehovah is God. That's what that, that word means. He, what do you know about him? He's the son of, of, of Pethuel, which means the vision of Jehovah, or as some will look at the open, his vision is open heartedness of the sincerity of, or his sincerity. Uh, that's toward them. But that's all we know about Joel, just like we don't know much about Obadiah. So a lot of background of what he is, but he is mentioned again in the New Testament. And we'll, we'll look at that this, this evening. So let's look. And I ask you, 2 Chronicles, uh, we've been looking at 2 Chronicles 21, 16, and we got Jehoahaz left, and now he's referred to as Ahaziah, 
in chapter 22 and verse 1. And so we begin to see this fact that here comes the next ruler, Ahaziah, and it's Jehoahaz in, in our text in, in Chronicles 21. So let's look at the rulers that we're looking at and kind of the history behind it. And this is in 2 Chronicles 22 through chapter 24. So if you're, or, and also 2 Kings 11 and 12. So if you want to look at the background of what I think the book of Joel in that time frame that was written, we'll see. Uh, you can put that together. So it kind of follows what we see where Obadiah is in chapter 21, 16 and 17. Chapter 22 through 24, we'll place in, in our study, the book of Joel. They were early books, uh, and, and they're written uh, kind of interesting in, in a way, but we'll, we'll see what Joel is all about. But that's kind of where we begin. He's the only one that's, that's left. He's the youngest son of the king in his stead. Who is his mother? Athaliah. Does that sound like a feminine name? Does, does to me. Uh, it, it, but we see in the Bible, in verse 2 of chapter 22, his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Amri. Now here you begin to tie in the northern kingdom and all of their idolatrous ways of Baal worship. You've got Ahab, what is his wife's name? Jezebel. And they're going to meet their demise as, as well. And we gotta have, we're going to be having Jehu in the times of these chapters we're looking at that's going to come after uh, the people, the, the kings, the, I guess the leading people of, of Jerusalem under uh, Athaliah's name and bring destruction on him. And he's going to, he's going to be killing uh, the son of Athaliah, who's Ahaziah, and she doesn't like it. And what does she do? I know we don't, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to move through ahead, ahead of this. I'm not going to make you have to answer it. But she kills everybody of the, of the seed when she finds out her son is dead. But there was one that saved. There's one that saved. Because what happens is Jehosha Beheth, that's a woman, she saves the youngest of that group, which will be King Joash. But in between this time, Athaliah, a woman, rules over the kingdom of Judah. Did you know that? You should. It's the truth. She reigns for six years. How long do our presidents reign between elections? Four. But she reigns six years. A woman? Is that there and ruling over the kingdom of Judah? The lineage of Jesus and David? It, yep, she is. Now, she didn't deserve it. <laughs> She wasn't one that was appointed by God to do that, but she killed all, all the people. And so here is the, a woman that saves her, her the Joash, saves Joash from being eliminated. Uh, she didn't get him, and that comes back to Honor, because there's a man that becomes very important in this section, Jehoiada. Who is he? He's not a king, that's why I got him in parenthesis. He's a high priest. He was a good man. And he was married to Shasha Behath. <laughs> and I just call her Mrs. Jehoiada. I mean, that'd be easier for me. But she's, he's married to her. And they got, also they, they have ties in with uh, dealing with, with Athaliah, who had dealings with Ahab in, in that lineage. So you have Jehoiada the priest, and when Jehu kills Athaliah, we, uh, kills Azariah, Athaliah begins to rule. But notice in verse tw chapter 23 and verse 1, in the seventh year, so Athaliah is just ruling because nobody's taking her down. In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and took the captains of hundreds. So he begins to get men around him, and we're going to go to the priest. He's the high priest. We're going to call on the priest, and we're going to get strong against Athaliah. Jehu comes upon the scene. He's, he's been appointed by God to take down Ahab and Jezebel. And in the meantime, while he's doing that, he'll take down Athaliah uh, because of her connections with that, that northern kingdom. So what happens then is Joash is set forth as, as king. 
And what we see as we enter into chapter 24, how old was Joash when he began to reign? Chapter 24 and verse 1. How old? 70? 17? <laughs> He's seven. Do you think he might need a counselor? He might not think so. But do you think he might need a counselor? If you look in the scripture, you'll see Athaliah was a counselor to his, her son. Well, who's going to be the counselor to Joash, you think? You'll have to think, you know, the high priest, Jehoiada. And so we'll notice in chapter 24 and verses 1 and 2, when he was seven years old, he began to reign. He reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah and, and, uh, of, of Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the eyes of Jehovah. How long? How long? That's that. That's right. All the days of Jehoiada, the high priest. And so that becomes a very in, important thing to under, understand that it was going to be kind of limited of what took place in the days of the high priest. So Jehoiada took for him two wives. He's quite a mentor, isn't he? He's kind of stepping in as, as, a, as a father, picks his two wives. He begets sons and daughters. Things are fine. But look at chapter 24 and verse 15. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days. I guess so. He died at 130 years of age, didn't he? So he had a, a long lineage of being helpful and being strong to take down the, the idolatrous Athaliah and her wickedness. They buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel toward God in his house. And after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened to God or hearkened unto them. Hearkened unto them. And they forsook the house of Jehovah. Jehoiada is probably turning in his tomb. They forsook the house of Jehoiada, the God of their fathers, served the Asherim. That's the plural. That's the female side of Baal. Oh, don't go back there and do what at the liar. And, oh, and we, we passed that. Asherim and the idols and the wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem, for this was their guiltiness. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again into Jehovah, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. I think this is where Joel is one of those prophets. And what is his warning as the book of Joel opens? We're going to be looking at God bringing forth locusts. Judgment's coming. Locusts is introducing that. And we'll see how uh, he uses that. And, and, and so this is kind of the background. It fits with Joel being a prophet and setting forth that the day of Jehovah is coming. And that is a big theme, and we'll see that in just a few moments in this particular book. But any, any questions on the, the, the situation that happened in, in Jerusalem? Uh, but Joash, he does okay. As a <laughs> ...of the truth of God, because they can forget it in a generation. And we always have to be involved in, in doing that. All right. 835, 830 B.C. is where we'll place that. Got 840, 845 B.C. for Obadiah. Here comes lesson two. Here comes Joel uh, on uh, coming right behind that. And I think it comes on the heels of what we see in the text of Chronicles as well. All right. Let's look at the day of Jehovah. That becomes a, a, an important theme uh, in th throughout this book of, of Joel. And in your outline, we've kind of divided into four areas of the day of Jehovah. So the day of Jehovah is destruction. Chapter 1 and verse 15. Alas, for the day of Jehovah. Now, your Bible will probably say the day of the what? The Lord. Now, Adonai, the Hebrew word Adonai can be Lord. 
But the reason my Bible says Jehovah, I know when that says Jehovah, it's Yahweh. And it's translated Lord. So you got different words for Lord, but you only got one Jehovah. This is the day of Jehovah, or as your translations will say, the day of the Lord. But if my uh, understanding of what the, the American Standard people did, when you see Jehovah, and you see uh, translating the word Yahweh, which was distinctly for Jehovah, you'll find Jehovah. So I say Jehovah, I know that's Yahweh probably there. And uh, it's, it's the case. It's, it's, and so he's almighty God. Destruction is coming. Should you fear that? Should you fear that? Well, yes, because in chapter 2 and verse 1, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Zion, Jerusalem, holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land do what? Tremble. Let them tremble for it is nigh at hand. The day of Jehovah is coming. It's nigh at hand. You ought to tremble. But all of a sudden we see, yes, it is a horrible day. It is a day in which you ought to tremble. But look with me in chapter 2 and verse 31. Because it says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Jehovah cometh. We will look at that type of language in detail in this lesson, not, probably not tonight. But we'll get there and that's imagery. And it's how it's used in Scripture that's important. It's not literally the moon's going to you know, be into blood and uh, the sun shall be turned into darkness. Uh, it, not literal, but it's a... It's, would that get your attention? That would get my attention if that happened. And it's, it's things are, are turned suddenly and it is overturned. And what is nations are, are brought under all of a sudden. And it says all of a sudden some catastrophe like that has happened. That's how the phrase is used. Therefore, I use it that way. I want to use the ways in which God says. And yet people say, oh, before the great day comes, you know, the sun's going to cease and not give its light and the moon. Well, you could take that literally, but that, I think, misses the point of how the phrase is used in Scripture. Other Scripture will help us understand that. And we'll talk about that in, in these lessons. But it's a great and terrible day of Jehovah cometh. But all of a sudden, a new tone is set. Because what does verse 32 say? And whosoever shall call on the name of Jehovah shall be what? Shall be delivered or saved. For in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, there shall be those that escape, as Jehovah has said. And among the remnant, those whom Jehovah doth call. As we shall see, the remnant, he's looking as it will be applied spiritually to the coming of salvation through Jesus. And the remnant will be saved of the Jews and uh, the Gentiles will have an opportunity to be saved as well. We saw that with Edom. Edom is a, is a foreign nation. And yet they have the prophecy that indeed they will be able to come to find help, refuge in, in Mount Zion as well. So all of a sudden we see hope bringing forth that well the day's coming you ought to tremble nations ought to tremble destruction is coming and in this context is coming on jerusalem it's not the end of time stuff it's coming on jerusalem we see how wicked the nation the, the people have become following after uh, idols and in, in joash's day so we see that happening and then something that's interesting too chapter 3 and verse 14 as we come to the end of the book multi multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of Jehovah is near in the valley of decision. God is bringing his decision upon a people who will not repent. And he says, the sun and the moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining. And says, Jehovah will roar in Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but Jehovah will be a refuge unto his people and a stronghold to the children of Israel. There's, give, there's hope for his people. It'll be a remnant that will have hope. But there again in, in his Mount Zion, that's where he'll roar from Mount Zion. That's where he'll have his refuge. Now, this is, helps us to understand two divisions in the book of Joel. 
And this first, first division that we see, if you look at your, your outline, uh, page two, I give three here, but you can divide this into two. The day of the Lord calls for God's people to respond. They ought to tremble. Judgment is coming. It is at hand. It's from the Almighty God. They don't have power over him. He'll bring it about. That's through, so divided up to chapter 2 and verse 17. It's destruction. You need to tremble. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope. But beginning in verses 18, and you can take that on through chapter 3, 21, God will respond to his people's mourning and repentance. And he'll create the day of salvation. We just saw that in connection with what happens beginning in this section in chapter 2. So the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, judgment plus blessings are coming. That's the way it is with, uh, with God's coming. Uh, and, and in any context we put it in. That's something you can always look at, and that's what Joel provides. But it divides the book up beautifully, that that first section, 1 and 2, uh, through chapter 2 and verse 17, is that destruction, fear, 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 and now there's hope, 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 hope. <laughs> and chapter 2 and verse 18, through chapter 3 and verse 21. Any uh, comments on that division? and about the day of, of Jehovah that we're talking about. Joshua 2, 28 through 32. We turn to Acts, the second chapter, and verse 16. You wonder why Joel is called the prophet of Pentecost? He might be called that, prophet of Pentecost. Because... First of all, let's look at the text. Hosea, uh, Joel, the second chapter, we'll see in verse 28. See if this sounds familiar to you in your New Testament reading. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants that are upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. As if the presence of God is coming and he's prophesying of judgment. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Jehovah. That's what Joel's been, we've seen that, that throughout his, 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 his prophecy. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Jehovah shall be what? We saw that too in the second half of Joel. So that's a very pivotal point. But I know what Joel was looking to. I know how Joel 2, 28, and the moon is not permanently red blood. The sun is shining. But it wasn't going to shine for that darkness is coming. So uh, in the context of God's judgment, this catastrophe that's taking place, that day in which the ultimate catastrophe will take place, this earth and heavens will be burned up completely. But what is he offering to us? So let's go to Acts, the second chapter. When we see Peter, the inspired apostle, he'll tell you when Joel 2, 28 through 32 was being fulfilled. You don't have to have any wonder about it because what had just happened in these first 13 verses of of acts 2 what has just happened Richard? very good a lot of people say the holy spirit came on everybody no it came on the apostles and why would he come on the apostles? They are the messengers of the Lord to do what he said, preach the gospel. So here was the initial preaching of the gospel after Jesus is in heaven. And it was the first Pentecost after his uh, death in Jerusalem. And Peter is standing up with the 11. Peter is one. And here's the 11. Here was the apostles. Of course, Judas, Judas has killed himself. 
But he standing up with the eleven, and he lifted up his voice and spake forth, saying, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto you this day, and give ear to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose. They are speaking in tongues, languages that they did not know and have learned. But what's interesting is that when you look at the different nations, the different dialects, and how we hear every man in our own language in which we are born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. They were speaking in languages that these Galileans didn't know. That was the, but the people who were born in that language said, they're speaking my language. And it's like when, when, when people who may have never learned English and they, all they knew is Chinese and all of a sudden they speak English. That impresses you. That's what these were doing. That was the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't, I'm speaking in tongues and nobody understands it and I feel good because I'm being energized. That's not what we get in the text. And that's not what we get in the New Testament about when the Holy Spirit empowered people to speak in language. It was a sign that they've been empowered by God because you just don't speak fluently in another language that you don't know and haven't studied. And they were speaking in the languages of men. You could see their location on the map. And they were the apostles. These Galileans are speaking this. And Joel is coming to the forefront. But this is that, verse 16, this is that which has been spoken through the prophet, what's his name? Joel. And it shall be in the last days. See, we're living in the last days. We've been living in the last days since Jesus established his kingdom upon this earth, the spiritual kingdom, the church. And we're in the last days. And, and, and Paul lived in the last days. Timothy lived in the last days. And because Jesus has come, he has set up his spiritual kingdom. He set up his rule in the hearts of people. He has confirmed the message with miracles, and we have the confirmed message. And he can come back any time for judgment. And but Joel is looking at God, God coming back in judgment, and we need to be prepared because what does he say as he says, all your daughters and sons shall prophesy. Holy Spirit will come upon women who are prophetesses in the New Testament days, inspired people. It will come upon them and in order to present the word. And so, and it shall be that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Acts 2.21, shall be delivered or shall be saved. So how do they start doing that in Acts 2? And they that received his word were baptized. There were added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Sound like they were delivered. What did, they, did they do that in the name of the Lord? Repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Unto the remission of your sins. So it started on that day. But it was, this is that. I can't, you can't get any more specific. This, what Joel is prophesied is, what, what is happening now, this is that, which what Joel prophesied. And that's why we begin to see, well, here's this spiritual fulfillment in the last half of Joel in the context in which he would bring Jerusalem down uh, from the prophecy of, of, J, of Joel. So we'll, we'll, put those, we'll try to put those pieces together. All right. Any questions on uh, the day of the Jehovah, the idea of Pentecost, how the book is divided in the time frame? How does the book of Joel... How does it open? There's something that, have you ever seen this, old man? Uh, it came in the day, in the day when he, he starts out, hear this, old man, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Have you been in your days, or in the days of your fathers, has this happened? So what is this? And what was it? And for the first two chapters, you need to keep coming back to it. What was it that happened? Locusts, one grasshopper on a hook and catching catfish in a pond. Wish we could do that again. What's that? Oh, that's a plague. 
uh, a plague of what? It's forming locusts. Uh, is that miraculous? Not necessarily. And I'm going to show you it's not necessarily. It happened in 2020. I thought, I thought the only plague we got was COVID. But I want us to see that here we look at what happened in the locust plague of 2020. It has started the last part of December. Now, this is in Eastern Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia. Iran uh, had, had these, this, this plague. It affected a lot of nations in the eastern part of Africa. But this is not new. You go back and look, 1950, 1920-something. A lot of times they would come from the southeast, which would be Africa. They would come from that southeast and head uh, from the southwest and head uh, northeast. But sometimes the brood of locusts would be those that change it. They come from the north uh, east and head southwest. And in Joel, you'll find that they're coming from the north in the book of Joel. But they would come from both directions. Is this lady having a problem? <laughs> 80 million locusts can be gathered together in a very short place of space, 80 million. And a lot of times the female will lay her eggs in the ground after the locusts have come by and, and eaten a little bit, some of those locusts, she will lay the, those eggs in the ground. And there may be 75,000 eggs and 65,000 survive. And they get young and they get to want to eat and they want to harm. And, and they, they, there's so many gathered together, they will continue to multiply. And that's why you get the swarm. But that's not miraculous. That's the way it works. But what happens is that this came on God's bidding. He said, bring it on. And so regardless, if this, if this, well, you're going to have to make a decision. Is the nation in chapter two or the army in chapter two, is that an army of man or is it an army of locusts? You'll have to make that decision as you study it. And we'll see in the first chapter, it's also called a nation. I'll bring a nation on you. Well, couldn't this swarm of locusts who's doing so much destruction to them, I see why they could be called a nation. And they could be called God's army, the Lord's army, because God is using them to bring destruction upon the people. And we see he's sending the locusts to wake you up. It's not the final destruction. Is to get you out of your stupor, you drunken people. That's the way Joel put it. And so we began to see that, that this is not a, a rocket thing. I, there, there he is, or there she is. In Kenya, in this 2020, that's kind of what the man was, he's trying to shoo him away. A lot of times the young people would shoo him away, and they're having problems in 2020 because they wake up at night with nightmares thinking that, that they're all coming after them again. It gets to them. And that's a plague. Pandemic, because it goes through many nations, causing such destruction. And yet, you can put one on your fingertip, and that's what he looks like. Real life stuff, up-to-date events that happened in the 9th century B.C. as well. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a miracle. But what is it? It's timing. And God brings that phenomenon or, or that, that, that was something that apparently you're not going to forget. You're not going to forget that. And we'll look at that in the first few verses. So he uses this as judgment. The day of the Lord is at hand. And here is what God Almighty has done. Now, what would the locusts, what would they devour? That would be very important to the people or crops well we'll still have new wine we'll still have grape juice really what crops would they destroy call you vines we'll still have our olive trees well they'll take care of them too 
Well, that's going to affect the priest. Yeah. That's going to affect people in their meal offerings. Yeah. Priest will be affected by that. Because here's the grain. Does it affect the grain? It affected every aspect of their lives. He's waking them up. And so we see how, how devastating it can be. And it was for the people in Kenya in 2020. And they have tried. What made it so difficult is that they wanted to bring the poison and yet what's happening where they couldn't, why they couldn't get the poison that they needed, COVID-19. They weren't able to get their supplies where they needed it. So they did a lot of suffering. But here we see this happening. Does the reference to the locust plague refer to various stages of development of the grasshopper or connected with that? Or is the devastation looked upon as, it's devastation as locusts come in waves? What imagery do you see when, now I'm, you'll have, the translations are, are, they're different. And that's why we ask this question. Now here's American Standard. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, the canker worm eaten, has eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar eat, eats, or has eaten. So you got canker worm and palmer worm and all of that. And some have said, well, th those are the different types of locusts. Do you get the imagery that, uh, w well, but no, that's the different, that's the locusts. But they're, 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 you know, five moats. They go through five moat stages uh, as come from, from uh, just the larva, the egg, the larva, and, and the, the full grown locusts. So these are just uh, the stages in which they are occurring. And some have said that's exactly right. I'm not arguing with that. Yes. And the wave is, you see that, the movement of the passage, don't you? Every word that you find in your text, locusts, they're a different Hebrew word. They're a different Hebrew word. So that's why, as well, they were, uh, they were different stages of the growth of a, of a locust. But some is locust, some is canker worm. It's a locust and a canker worm. And so they're looking at, well, that's stages. So it has its place. But I wrote down in the Hebrew word that uh, if you always you with the New King James, what does that first locust, and you can just say it out loud to me because if you've got the New King James, we'll go through that. It's, instead of the palmer worm, what do you have? Chewing. We're coming in stages. We've got the chewing locust. What's the next one? Swarming locust. That's probably, as some of that would be your grasshopper. They're swarming now. They, they, they may be a, a, a smaller, a, a younger stage for the chewing, but uh, it's chewing, it's swarming. What's the third one? Crawling locusts. Some would say, well, that's the, those are the small ones and the younger ones and all of that. Maybe the caterpillar, then he, then he crawl. Uh, that type of thing. And what's the next one? What's kind? Consuming locusts. So either one of those stages you wouldn't like, would you? They're devastating. I think they're coming in the swarms, they're coming in the different waves as, as some are just chewing. Then you get a bunch of st stormy ones that are coming, a swarming ones. You got the crawling ones. Whether I don't know what stages they are. I don't think they're different types of locusts. I think it's the locusts coming in waves, causing destruction in the distinctive ways that they can do that. I already know that the females will lay the eggs and, and, and they'll develop. So they're coming out of the ground and they're crawling on the ground and then they, they get together and uh, millions are, are doing their job. So I, I, I take it the idea of the waves of coming. 
chewing. I like the new, the new King James says that. Was it American Standard? Uh, it, uh, it, some of you have the e, uh, English Standard Version. Does, what does it say? Some of them are a little different. Some of them are pretty close to the same. But really, the two areas of, of thought is, is there. Uh, I, I know our time is short, but how quickly that we can do this one. How memorable was this locust destruction as to reference to the past? How memorable is it in reference to the past? Who does he address? Old man, have you ever seen this? No, probably not. How is it memorable to those in the future? Tell your what? Children. And children, you tell your children. And children, you tell your children. This is an event that even though we see them happening in history, this was an event that was memorable. The old man's never seen anything like this, and the young people are not going to forget it if they do what Joel says to do. And we'll have to, to stop there. So hopefully you'll be back uh, next week. We'll, we'll be in with question number three in your outline, and then we'll continue on our study.